psychiatric hospitals, or from what they used to be known as insane asylums, have changed dramatically over time. Over 5,000 years ago, the mentally ill had their brain poked with sharp instruments. This was known as trepanation. The goal was to release evil spirits from their head. From the 5th to the 16th century, mental illnesses were still known to be caused from the supernatural, but individuals were tortured, burned at stake, hung, or decapitated. The intentional murder of the mentally ill began to diminish in the 17th and 18th century. People believed that the mentally ill were impaired at physical state and self-inflicted through excess passion. They were believed to be giving themselves the illness on purpose. So then they would be treated without compassion and or tolerance, and they lived in poor living conditions because of so. It was common for them to be chained to walls or in cages as well. The turn of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century was the introduction of psychopharmacology to cure mental illness from diseases and or brain damage. Prior to the 20th century, Canadian, American, and English, English societies ran a moral and humanitarian approach when it came to mental illness, and this was known as moral management. Individuals at the time were considered incurable, and so they would spend their entire lives under care. It was also important that where they stayed resembled a home-like appearance. And at these homes, the mentally ill would perform tasks such as sorting potatoes or, or gardening to contribute to society while being monitored. And um, these tasks um, help the communi community economically. At the beginning of the 20th century, institutionalization began. And this is when insane asylums were a very popular place for relatives to drop off elders they could no longer afford to care for or for rebellious teens uh, when, uh, whose parents admitted them to stay, and they were even temporary homes for the homeless. I became a psychiatric nurse because of my grandmother, Eleanor. She was a psychiatric nurse between 1937 to 1969, and at the time, she was, they were referred to as intendants instead of psychiatric nurses. Um, when she worked at asylums, the population reached its peak at this time, so there was, she would work with at least 50 patients at a time. So it was very stressful and very overwhelming for all of the attendants who worked in that hospital. And um, this was really affected the proper care and efficiency of how the patients were treated, and it really wasn't letting them be cured to their full potential. And the treatments even used at this time were quite unethical as well. The treatments they had used during the era of institutionalization were considered as the experimental age of the psychiatric hospitals. Malaria therapy was invented by Julius Wagner in 1917. And at the time, mental illnesses were considered to be caused by a type of syphilis. Um, a type of microorganism, a bacteria that would infiltrate the brain before a person is born. And because of that bacteria, they thought that it would cause symptoms such as what we call nowadays bipolar or schizophrenia. And so Wagner started testing his treatments by injecting the patients with strep throat and malaria bacteria, causing them to become extremely ill. So a treatment that was popular at the time my grandmother worked in insane asylums was insulin therapy. She told me that this type of therapy was originally used on drug addicts with lower levels of insulin in their blood. So a man named Manfred Sackle, he was a neurophysiologist and a psychiatrist, and he was the first one to test this insulin shock therapy on patients who were mentally ill. So what they did was inject the patients with insulin which would result in a lowering of their blood sugar levels and they would go into a coma for hours at a time. And they would often repeatedly repeat the seizure for as much as six days in a row. And when or if they woke up from the coma, they would be a lot more calm and their psychiatric symptoms diminished and improved dramatically. 
lot of the patients did become obese though because insulin pushes glucose into the cells resulting in fat gain or they had severe brain damage or they just never awoken from their coma. Lobotomies were banned in Canada during the 1960s. Back then it was very popular for this procedure because the ratio between medical staff and patients was very unbalanced. Due to the lack of doctors, lobotomies were the quick fix treatment widely available. A common type of lobotomy that was used were ice pick lobotomies. Ice pick lobotomies were performed by physicians to treat mental illnesses such as severe depression and schizophrenia. To begin this treatment, the patient would have to be strapped down with the help of hospital attendants. Then they would be shocked with electrical currents and preparation for physical insertion. After they were fully stable, one of their eyelids would be rolled back and a rod-like device would be inserted through the upper part of the eye into the patient's head. Using a hammer, the device would be penetrated into several portions of the frontal lobe and the brain. And the frontal lobe is the part of the brain responsible for thinking, planning, organizing, problem solving, movement, and short-term memory. After the procedure is completed, the patient will experience change in personality and behavior. Sometimes the result of the procedure may lead to severe brain damage or death. So even though these treatments were very unethical, it actually had a very high chance of the patients being completely cured from using these types of procedures. And this was because it changed their personality so much and really damaged their brain. But death was often a potential side effect, so this is why we don't toy with these treatments anymore because we never play with death and we would never put our patients under that kind of danger. And there's actually this other type of therapy that we still use today that they've been using since the beginning of the 1900s. This is called electroconvulsive therapy. And so what electroconvulsive therapy is, is high doses of electrical currents that go through the brain and it damages the brain slightly. And often this would lead to severe brain damage, memory loss, or fractured bones back then because it was done under no amnesia. And this was also used during lobotomies as well to calm down the patients because they would be struggling so much. So now we use this therapy under amnesia and the electrical currents aren't as high or severe as they used to be. Patients have to be wanting to do this type of therapy and the person who performs this type of therapy must be highly trained and understand the machine. So I am not trained in this type of therapy, but I have assisted and I've seen very very positive results from using this therapy so I highly recommend it if narcotics aren't working for you and it's been proven to really cure schizophrenia and bipolar disorder so it's a very highly recommended therapy to use today. Hi I'm Renette and I self-admitted myself into a psychiatrist hospital two years ago. I did that because I was diagnosed with um, depression eight years ago and I really hit rock bottom. Um, the experience was really great for me. Uh, even though every day we had like a repetitive routine, it was kind of boring. But I met a lot of people who shared the experience with me. They was understanding and supportive. And I met with my psychiatrist and my group therapy uh, twice a week. It was really nice and to know that I'm not alone and I can get through this hard time just with the right help. So the success rate has improved for psychiatric hospitals. There are no definite statistics that prove this, but from reading into the history and now the changes they have gone through, I personally believe that individuals with a mental illness have a higher potential of climbing back up from hitting their rock bottom. There are greater numbers, unfortunately, of individuals who have had at least one mental illness in their life than from the past, but this is obviously because of social media influences. And there's also others as well, but I personally believe that social media has a huge impact on mental illness. And the stigma of mental illness has and are improving to this day, which is great. And there's also more options for the mentally ill to be cured. And with deinstitutionalization, which began in the 1960s after institutionalization, 
this is um, it gave more areas in the hospitals that can help patients with a mental disorder and these are just general hospitals as well so this avoids overcrowding in psychiatric hospitals and it gives workers such as myself more opportunities to really get to know my patients and help them reach their full potential. Thank you.